Good morning. I'm in Aachen, Germany, and it's about 11 o'clock in the morning here, and back on the East Coast, it's about 5 a.m. So as I'm standing here today, this is Aachen, Germany, as I stated, and this is the area where the 97th Infantry Division, our father's uh, unit, as you see the crest, the patch, uh, marched through these streets. And it came right through here in this cathedral that I'm trying to get you to see was not destroyed during World War II. It was kept and in place and intact. And as they marched through, they probably went over and got rested at the, at the fountain or whatever. And as they moved through the city, and I'll give you more history on how this Windy. So you can see, as you may or may not travel, you have a town center, and I'll spin around, and you can see this is what they call the market, and some of the market is being set up behind me as I turned around. But as you can see, so in Occam they have the cathedral. It's very famous here it did survive World War II and I can't really get it all in it's so large but we're gonna go inside here in a few minutes but I wanted to show you the size of this thing it's about three city blocks maybe and then you can see the people gathering to go in <laughs> so here I am in Occam um, once again I'll, I'll scan around and some of you may or may not have been in Europe or you read about it. Um, you can see that there usually is a town square or a market area in the, in the middle of the city. And as I pan on around, you can see where some of the marketplace is being taken. That's the cathedral again. Like I said, it was not destroyed during World War II. It was still here. And as I keep moving around, you can see that um, it's a very pretty city. and like everything else and historical they have class students come in to visit and everything so as you see as we move around there's a better view of the fountain and then I'm going to pan over again towards the front door the entrance area and then of course you see the Ukrainian flag so it's very interesting as I stated earlier when I was in the hard France before I made it to Occam that um, once again Europe finds itself not only on the brink of war, but in a war. So I made a mistake. This is called the town hall. And also it was not destroyed during World War II, nor was the cathedral. So I'm in here now and you can see there's beautiful paintings and everything on the walls. So I'll make a correction with another video, but I want to show you the cathedral and it's not coming through so we'll pick it up again so i told everyone that i was in the cathedral but i'm not i'm in the town hall and that's the cathedral and i'm going there next it's very medieval looking and everything and it was not also destroyed during world war ii so we'll see this town hall and then we'll go over there well i'm inside what is the town hall and this was the center of Charlemagne's domain or palace complex, the town hall, the castle hall, and the cathedral. It was once the focal point of the empire of truly European proportions. Occam is a historical town and a city of science and a European city whose story can be seen as a history of Europe. Charlemagne, as you see here, Built the town hall itself stands on the foundation walls of a former king's hall, which was built in the style of the Roman Basilica. It is about 47 meters long and nearly 21 meters wide, and probably consisted of a single story with the height measured from the floor of today's rat's keller of nearly 21 meters. This area here shows the remaining cathedral, which is across the street from where we are. So you can see what was what it looked like after World War II. So now we're in the main hall area. 
In this area, Charlemagne had made Ockham not only the seat of his imperial administration, but also, for a time, the most influential center of culture in Europe. Prominent thinkers and scholars from all over Europe would gather here around these halls, and a delegation from all corners of the known world would visit his court, which became a fixed point in the triangle power between Rome and Byzantine, the Eastern Roman Empire. That would be better. So Charlemagne had made Occam not only the seat of his imperial administration, but also at the time the most influential center of culture in Europe. Prominent thinkers and scholars from all over Europe would gather here around these halls. Delegation from all corners of the known world would visit this court, which had become a fixed point in the triangle power with Rome and the Eastern Roman Empire. The Eastern Roman Emperor sent emissaries to pay homage to Charlemagne, and the Caliph of faraway Baghdad honored him with gifts, and one of them the legendary white elephant Adul Abbas. You may not hear it, but the bells are, are ringing over in the cathedral, and you may not be able to to hear them, but what we're looking at here is the crown jewels of Charlemagne. And like every royal coronation, you had to have your medieval crowns and other items during the celebration. This is in a small choir bay of the former town hall chapel. In the east walls of the hall, you can see exact copies of the original commissioned by Kaiser Wilhelm II for a planned expedition in 1915. Of course, you had a little thing called World War I that prevented that from ever happening. So I want to go back and correct some things here. Um, this is not the cathedral. This is the town hall. And there are earlier videos that I made inside the town hall that explains everything. But just a quick recap. Charlemagne was the king and he made Occam the center of his royal palace complex and administration of his empire. So it's very interesting and everything. In 1943 to 1944, half of this building or complex was destroyed. So basically the second floor and above was, was still intact and it took them 20 years to restore it. So the cathedral that is behind this was not destroyed during World War II. And I wanted to just clarify what I was saying, but it's still good information and everyone knows the history of Charlemagne. So what you see here is the flower market. And I'm gonna show you some more of the city here. This is a pub or a little restaurant on the side. cathedral and we'll be going to next and it's just a typical little town center people walking around doing their business you can see just about everything that to me looks closely to the Romanovs emblem for Imperial Russia it says the year was 1723 so right here, I'm at the back of the town hall. And you can see how the center is here. Probably parts of dad's 
infantry division was scattered all through here resting from their march and as I said earlier I'll cover more of that but there is the cathedral that was not damaged during World War II well the bell just tolled and I hope it didn't toll for me for the that's the correct way of saying it but you can see a large area here I'm gonna try to see if I can get in it's probably on the other road talk to you later so loosely translating this it says from 1933 to 1945 in Occam between the 10th of July and the 25th of July 1937 800,000 Catholics came here on a pilgrimage in order to sh show their faith in the Christianity and the Catholic Catholics um, in spite of this, the Nazi regime was what they were protesting in opposition to uh, what was happening in Germany by the nationalists. So, pretty interesting. So here we are, like I said, we're in the square behind the town hall. Um, down this street that you see over in this direction, where the bicycle is, is uh, I hear Jewish music as well as some French music being played different times. And here we go. This is the cathedral that was not destroyed during World War II. So it's a nice shiny day. It's still a little chilly here in Occam, but it beats being out in the cold somewhere else. This is a very unusual sight. It's just a few minutes after noon here in Occam, Germany, but look how the sun is directly behind and making the halo effect of the church in the background. So maybe that's a hope for Ukraine and Russia to come to some agreement here. But this is the cathedral. You can see that is very beautiful right now. I'm going to try to catch a video of this whole square because there's a unique situation going on behind me right now. Here's the interesting thing, and I took photos of this to make sure that you could see it. So let me up. Now this is just a few minutes after noon, but look how the sun just in the perfect spot that it just looks like an, an orb around it or a halo, whatever you want to call it. But there's no one else here that sees it. Everybody's just walking through their home day. A few people stop and take pictures. But I don't know they've seen this. This is beautiful. That's a very unique shopping area. Just a short walk from the market. Um, looks like they mostly cater to bread and crackers and desserts and things like that. So you see right next to it is a jewelry shop. So it's very interesting to see. It's what I like about European cities with their market centers and stuff you don't need a car you just walk you see some of the kids down there from school so here we are at the back of the cathedral um, you can see it's another little square um, spark is Occam don't know what exactly that means but it might be a shopping center or something People going about their business. Cafe, restaurants, getting ready for, you can't see it, but the Easter parties and stuff, so they're getting ready for spring. Here's the other side. It's very beautiful and everything. It looks like um, Westminster Abbey. Some of the designs and the book and on the sides. As I was telling you earlier, 800,000 Catholic came to Otham the 10th through the 25th of July to show their belief in the Catholic faith and to basically challenge the Nazi regime of what they were doing are about to do. I'm going to spin around real quick, sorry. But you can see 
just how much gold is in here, how beautiful it is. And stained glass everywhere. Then, of course, you see the dove of peace, the cross, and the Bible. It's pretty interesting being here almost 77 years to the day that our father came through here and knowing that this place survived World War II. And as my father and others from the 97th Infantry Division moved through this area. Talk to you later. So after the battle was over, more than 325,000 Germans, including 30 general officers, were prisoners of war. The senior German commander in the rural pocket was Field Marshal Mogul reportedly committed suicide rather than surrender. When the defeat of the Army Group B, Germany lost control of the war and from that time on was only able to offer token opposition to the advancing Allied forces. During the Battle of the Ruhr Pocket, American infantrymen faced several levels of enemy resistance. Sometimes the Germans offered only slight or token opposition and then quickly surrendered. Advancing American units frequently encountered moderate and stiff resistance prior to enemy prior to the enemy surrendering, SS troops and members of an elite military unit of the Nazi party usually fought to the death. Well, in St. Nicholas's Chapel, I found this on the wall. so dark where I found it, it's very hard to see, but okay. So a quick learning tool here in Europe. You better have some money with you if you want to go to the bathroom. Train station, villages, tourist places. You better have those 50 cents. 1 euro, 2 euros, 3 euros, I've seen all the prices. So you got to have it if you come to Europe. Bring your change. So I talked to you earlier about this building here. Come to find out it is a bank. So you see the tell signs of an ATM machine and people are starting to move a lot more and you can see way down there is another street that branches off. Of course you have the Musicians out trying to make some money here on a beautiful day. You can hear the <laughs> so, a funny thing, I saw that image with a big D, like a Disney D, and the little image I thought was Mickey Mouse when I was way up the street, about six, seven blocks away. Comes to find out it's not Disney, it's just a restaurant and that's their mascot sort of like Ronald McDonald <laughs> oh well so I found Kelsey's favorite shop bookstore but they're all in German there goes a scooter guy Moby Dick in German. Homer's Odyssey in German. What else I can see? Walden, written in German. Heidi, The Musketeers. Pretty interesting. Well, right now I'm in a a grocery store, maybe a little fast food, a uh, little, little market store. But you, Kelsey, Judy, and Kathy, you guys can survive. There's Diet Coca Cola, there's lemonade, interesting bottles of Pepsi and Zero Pepsi and Pepsi Max. So just about everything that you want. Well, this is the Occam Theater. Um, evidently, it's a very famous here in Occam and in this part of Europe. It's 
so it's very interesting. They, they have something to do with horses in this part of Germany. They got horses everywhere. Statues, wooden statues. I'm gonna take a taxi back. As you've seen from our walk around Occam and everything, you can see some of the areas where the 97th Infantry Division came through the center square and all. But I'm gonna give you a little background information in regard to what did they face? What did our my father, your father, your grandfather, your great-great-grandfather and all face when they were here? The importance of the Ruhr, which is the industrial area that, that basically we're around right now, um, was greatly diminished by the heavy bombing raids in early 1945. The German Army Group B, consisting of about 350,000 German soldiers, still defended the region as American forces approached. The Battle of the Ruhr Pocket was one of the last major battles of World War II. Over 825,000 American and German soldiers fought in the Ruhr. Three American armies, the 1st, the 9th, and the 15th, were all involved in the elimination of the Ruhr Pocket. 17 Army divisions, including the 97th, fought in this battle, which took place from a period of April 1st to April 19th. Well, here I am in Occam's train station, on my way to Dusseldorf, and the train arrives at 1322 or 1.22 p.m. and it's the right train to Dusseldorf. So I'll talk to you later from Dusseldorf. There is one of the trains right there. Here I'm in Upham's train station and the train I'm going to be riding on is the Rhine Rural Express. Well, I made it here to Dusseldorf and the hotel is about three minutes from here so the main train stations are way over there and this is the train I just finished riding on just pulling out to continue its journey talk to you later once again I'm here um, we I just arrived in Dusseldorf so I'm going to give you a little history of the 97th Infantry Division. This was their first assignment in Germany, was to occupy defensive positions along the western bank of the Rhine River opposite Dusseldorf. While in this location, the Division infantrymen were involved in small unit actions with German patrols. A few Nazi soldiers were killed or captured, but the 97th was soon on the move to join other divisions involved in the early phase of the Battle of the Ruhr Pocket. The division moved south, crossing the Rhine River near Bonn. Its mission was to establish positions on the southern bank of the Sig River, which runs at a right angle to the Rhine, and be prepared for offensive operation. Along the southern bank of the Sig River to the right of the 97th were the 78, the 8, the 86 infantry divisions. These divisions formed the 18th Airborne Corps, which was commanded by Major General Matthew B. Ridgway. On the northern bank of the Sig River facing the 18th Corps were four German divisions identified as the 59th, the 62nd, 363rd, and the 11th Panzer Divisions. Located throughout the pocket were elements of many types of enemy units including airborne, armored, SS, and anti-aircraft, etc. The mission of the 18th Corps was to clear all territory south of the Ruhr River the mission of the 97th Infantry Division was to cross the Sig River in coordination with the other infantry divisions of the 18th Corps and attack north towards Dusseldorf. On April 6 at 5 a.m., the next day all four divisions were on the move. The 97th Infantry Division sector, bridges across the Sig River had been destroyed or seriously damaged. During the first five days of the operation, 
The division constructed five treadway bridges, two infantry support bridges, six infantry support rafts, in addition to seriously damaged bridges were repaired and a damaged railroad bridge was repaired in flank. Once across the Sig River, the infantry began their coordinated drive towards Dusseldorf. Sniper fire increased as the American advanced through parts of the city. Using small arms, machine guns, and gr grenades, they attacked enemy troops street by street, house by house. Despite fierce resistance by the Germans, by nightfall, the city was quiet. As American soldiers entered the buildings, the enemy troops retreated through holes in the floors. Firefights took place in tunnels and rooms under many of the buildings. Finally, flamethrowers had to be used against the Nazis to force them to surrender. Before the war, Dusseldorf was a large industrial city of 500,000 inhabitants that had been the economic, political, and cultural center of the rural area. There was a free movement gain momentum within Dusseldorf. The purpose of this political group was to salvage what was remained of the proud industrial center. Representatives of the free movement visited the command post and promised to surrender the city without further assistance. resistance. General Halsey entered Dusseldorf and went directly to the police station, headquarters of the Gestapo and city police. After a brief discussion, Dusseldorf formally surrendered. After operation in the rural pocket was completed, the 97th Infantry Division was quickly transferred to the 3rd Army sector along the Czechoslovakian border. On April 23, 1945, the division protected the left flank of the 3rd Army as it advanced southeast to attack enemy forces in southern Germany and Austria. The first objective of the Trident Division was to seize the city of Kiev. 